going to the peasants or the object, the thing, right? That's, that's in a nutshell the way to understand what formalism is. Um, and I want to take just a minute before we move on to sort of summarize what we think about that. What are the strengths and the gains from doing such a thing? I mean, from the project. And then what are the weaknesses of that project? So let's start with the strengths. What do you see as the strengths of formalism? Minimalism, maybe as being the example we'll take. What do you think? What's good about it? Regarding the meaning of a thing only by way of its reference. And that makes sense, right? What's the meaning of this painting? It has to do with the guy who's pictured in it. But the problem with that is that if you, if you push me on that, and if you start taking away the image of the guy on the canvas, do I really believe that the thing is meaningless before he gets there? And if so, that's really problematic, right? Do I really believe in a world that's essentially meaningless until we start assigning meaning to it? Uh, and if our, if our answer is yes on that, that in one way or another makes us nihilists, <laughs> right? It's a meaningless world um, until we start doing something to it. Uh, one of the real virtues, I think, of this project of pulling away from the representation or the reference or the image or the illusion or whatever you want to call that side of this mysterious union that hung on the painting is to cause us to see the form in itself as deeply meaningful. That the canvas, the shapes, the colors that present themselves, the textures, all of those things, the way the world presents itself is already deeply meaningful. That sound Experience as sound and the relationship between sound, color, experience as color, the relationship between color launches us already into realms of deep meaningfulness. And, and if, you, if you pull artwork to focus uh, primarily on those formal appearances, 
appearances. Uh, you start to, I think, regard the rest of the world around us as everywhere meaningful, the way that it presents itself. Does that, does that make sense? Form itself as being deeply meaningful. And I think, I think we can't pass over minimalism uh, before learning that lesson because it's a really important lesson. Meaningfulness of form. And I think specifically, um, in this community, we would regard all of the world as tremendously meaningful. And you're being knit together in such a way to experience it the way that you do uh, already have meaning in it before you assign values to it and narratives to it and so on.
maybe, uh, well, it does point us to where we're going this afternoon, but it might also launch us into kind of more discussion of what are the weaknesses of this system. I do want to address that quickly. There's some weaknesses. And, uh, Amy, you had a comment before that.
already prepared to regard for as useful. Uh, so this, this, this kind of presumption that, that an object can just be encountered as an object, as a presence, and just encounter it and regard that as meaningful, uh, maybe ignores, ignores all the ways that that encounter is already set up, held up, supported, and rendered intelligible by all of the forms of language and cultural exchange, economic exchange, social, social exchange that make the thing possible. Does that make sense? And once we start having that conversation, then it seems like purity becomes strange abstraction that no one can really name. What is purity? Is this pure? Is geometry steel pure? Is any object in a museum pure? What does that even mean <laughs> for those to be pure or pure or, or pure visual experience? Uh, as soon as I start talking at all, is it still pure visual experience? Yeah.
conventional means it's supposed to arc in that way. Uh, that's a, a little bit of a deviation from your comment, but it's an awfully uh, uh, wonderful lead in to where we're going this afternoon, huh? And that is with this. We've been following a, a few narratives in this class so far, and primarily all of those narratives could be loosely referred to as modernist narratives. We've been using Clement Greenberg pretty heavily to help us um, define what modern is, but it seems to be this push towards formalism, towards the purity of the medium, and those sort of things. And I think that where that pushes to is minimalism. I think ultimately, if you take it to its logical end, you get minimalism. And that's what those lessons are doing. They take it to its logical end. That narrative runs through the 70s. Probably you can run it to about mid 70s. So you've got modernism, minimalism. Of course, it's going to continue running in a variety of ways. But uh, we need to go back and start pulling out some other threads that have also been wrapped up in the same time. So we were looking at Jackson Pollock, that's where we started the class, in the, the late 1940s, and we've, been, we've worked up to the 70s. I want to go back now to the 50s and uh, start tracking a different train of thought. Um, and that train of thought, the, the guy we're going to use to think through that train of thought is represented here, or not represented, this is his work. This is in the 50s, and this is not pure at all. <laughs> if we're talking about pure form and pure uh, media, pure materials, or something like that, this is not that at all. This is a mess. This is radically impure. This is, these are discarded fragments from all over the urban landscape. Um, this stuff is full of reference and really messy references. Um, this artist is Robert Rauschenberg, and we'll talk about him for the rest of the afternoon. And you can date Rauschenberg to 1955. Uh, obviously, he uh, made lots of work for many years after that, but when he is first begins to be really important uh, for us in, in our narrative is 55. So you can locate him there and then work out, uh, work away from there. And as you look at this image of Rauschenberg, it's a very telling image. Uh, where is he? Yeah, in a junkyard, in an abandoned lot. He's located somewhere. And he's located specifically within uh, uh, what seems to be cast offs, discarded, the discarded material of the city of Madison. Uh, what else do you notice about this image? Casual. What's that? Casual. Casual, yeah. Yeah, you probably don't have the. I mean, the, the modernist project has often been sort of associated with the kind of macho <laughs> man, uh, often. Or maybe not exclusively, but uh, a kind of seriousness. This is art. And uh, this is about the logical consistency of art making. Um, Rauschenberg <laughs> doesn't seem, I mean, this is just a, a photograph. Uh, so we're, we're reading into it. But uh, he doesn't seem to be presenting himself in that way. If anything, you kind of have this ironic smirk on his face. Uh, and I think that is pretty appropriate for uh, kicking off our discussion of Rauschenberg. What else do you notice? One other thing. What is he, what is he reading? The newspaper. The newspaper, yeah. Um, popular culture, news, information is where Rauschenberg sort of throws himself headlong. If, if formalism uh, was much more about um, removing 
the artwork from its cultural ties and cultural associations and information overloads. If, if <coughs> it's about removing the art object from those, isolating it from that as much as possible, Rauschenberg is about heaving it into it and just sort of throwing oneself into the information uh, overload and into those cultural ties. And in fact, one could argue that his work from top to bottom is those cultural ties, the cultural associations. So here's his odalisque, which, what, do you know what odalisque has been historically? Sort of painting the perspective, reclining the nude. Uh, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of hodgepodge conglomeration of discarded images, fabric, Objects, <coughs> like of what appears to be a piano, a pillow. I mean, you can read into this thing in quite a few ways, uh, but uh, it's sort of open ended. Feels like it's referencing in too many directions. If that painting references in a really neat, pretty straightforward way, this is taking on the references and just multiplying. They're multiplying all over the place, maybe in a way so that it doesn't add up to a single. In your uh, optional reading for today, I gave you a, a, an artist statement by uh, an artist named Klaus Oldenburg, who is a contemporary of Rauschenberg and someone who we won't talk about so much in the class, but who uh, you can basically understand in relation to Rauschenberg. Uh, and I want to read part of his artist statement because I think this is a, a wonderful introduction to Rauschenberg. Um, and this is titled, I Am For An Art. This is written in the 60s, at least it could be printed a while ago later. And he says this, I am for an art that grows up not knowing it is art at all, an art given the chance of having a starting point of zero. I am for an art that embroils itself with the everyday craft and still comes out on top. I am for an art that imitates the human that is comic, if necessary, or violent, or whatever is necessary. I am for an art that takes its form from the lines of life itself, that twists and extends and accumulates and spits and drips and is heavy and coarse and blunt and sweet and stupid as life itself. I am for an art who vanishes, turning up in a white cap painting, signs or hallways. I am for an art that comes out of a chimney like black hair and scatters in the sky. I am for an art that spills out of an old man's purse when he is bounced off a passing fender. I am for the art of a doggy's mouth falling five stories from the roof. I am, from, I am for an art that a kid licks after peeling away the wrapper. I am for an art that joggles like everyone's knees when the bus traverses an excavation. I am for an art that is smoked like a cigarette, smells like a pair of shoes. I am for an art that flaps like a flag or helps blow noses like a handkerchief. I am for an art that is put on and taken off like pants, which develops holes like socks, which is eaten like a piece of pie or abandoned with great contempt. I am for an art covered with bandages. I am for art that limps and rolls and runs and jumps. I am for art that comes in a can or washes up on the shore. I am for art that coils and grunts like a wrestler. I am for art that sheds hair. <laughs> I am for art you can sit on. I am for art you can pick your nose with or stub your toes on. I am for art from a pocket, from deep channels in, of the ear, from the edge of a knife, from the corners of the mouth, stuck in the eye or worn on the wrist. I am for art under the skirts and the art of pinching cockroaches. I am for the art of conversation between the sidewalk and a blind man's metal stick. What a, what a wonderful line. I am for the art that grows in a pot that comes down out of the skies at night like lightning that hides in the clouds and grow, clouds and growls. I am for art that is flipped on and off with a switch. I am for art that unfolds like a map that you can squeeze like your sweetie's arm or kiss like a pet dog. Sort of, 
funny rehearsal, <laughs> which expands and squeaks like an accordion, which you can spill your dinner on like an old tablecloth. I am for an art that you can hammer with, stitch with, sew with, paste with, file with. I am for an art that tells you the time of day or where such and such a street is. I am for an art that helps old ladies across the street. <laughs> and on and on. Uh, what is he, he is for an art that is what? What's that? Life. Every day, mundane life, right? Um, if he's writing this in the 60s, early 60s, in New York, uh, you know what context he's writing it in. Um, uh, Greenberg has just written modernist painting and has been writing a lot. Uh, Frank Stella is uh, making his paintings and so on. Formalism has, is, has become very formalized. And people like Rauschenberg and Oldenburg are coming along and they're saying, I want art to be so thoroughly embroiled in everyday life and common cultural exchange. I don't want it to be removed or distant from that at all, or to have any pretense that it can be. I want art to be thoroughly embroiled in it. Uh, and the work that we get from both of these artist and from a few others that we'll uh, talk about, is the art, as one might say, of everyday life. It's the stuff of everyday life. The, uh, the, the remnants, the debris uh, from everyday life. Um, here's Rauschenberg's monogram. <coughs> and what do you see? Here's just from a different point of view. What is this, what is this work? How would you describe it? What's that? Interesting. <laughs> that all descriptive word. Yeah. I mean, we've got all sorts of stuff going on. First, it's a flat platform that sits on the floor, which is of interest. It looks like this should be a painting because it's built like a painting, and it's mostly handled like a painting, but it lays on the floor. So that's first. And then what goes on in this? I mean, what, what do you sort of see here from, from your point of view? Collage, yeah. Collage of pictures from newspapers and magazines. There's, there, there's, there, there's paper in there. There's fragments. There's some paint, so it's a painting. But there's all of this stuff in the painting. The paint is not pure at all, <laughs> or even aesthetically removed at all. It's full of all sorts of fragmentary stuff. The stuff from the lot, uh, one could imagine, that he was sitting in in that earlier picture. And then standing on top of this painting is the stuffed Angora goat. <laughs> that, that Rauschenberg saw in a uh, in a, a failing office supply store, and I don't know why it was in an office supply store. I still don't really understand that. I guess they were selling secondhand things out of the front window or something. He saw this thing, loved it, wanted it, kept kept going back to look at it, and eventually purchased it from the store for thirty five dollars. And she spent a lot of time shampooing it and cleaning it up. <laughs> oh, only to uh, sort of harness it in this tire. And then to paint its face <laughs> in such a way that it seems as though the goat has gotten into the paint. Right? Now, the title of this work is Monogram. Uh, do you know that word? What is what is that? What is a monogram? Initials. Yeah, good. Uh, it, within the Christian tradition, the the, uh, the monogram of Christ is is often written as the key row, so what looks like a P and an X, or it's actually an X and a P. 
the first two letters of the word Christ in uh, Greek. And so it's a symbol that is a, is a kind of a signature that designates a person. So it's a, a, an efficient way of referring to a specific person. Um, so, it's, so what is this a monogram of? Is this, is this the artist? Is this a self-portrait? Is he the goat? Is he the goat that has gotten into the paint, so to speak, made a mess of things, and is as skilled at the paint as a goat might be, <laughs> or is, behaves towards the paint in a, in a way that's more akin to a goat than it is to a, a, a virtuoso? Yeah. several of these things, and here you see that first that first one that we talked about, this over here, the odalisk, you actually see is a container, it's a three-dimensional box that the rooster is standing on. Um, big deal inside. Oh, well, we can't go into it because we got too many hands to If you're interested in that sculpture, ask me afterwards. I have a lot to say about that. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Uh, he referred to these things as 
as combine. What are they? Are they paintings? Are they sculptures? He refers to them as combine. And he says this, I called them combine. I had to coin that word because I got so bored with the arguments. I was interested in people seeing my work. If I said, it is a painting, they would say, that's not a painting, it's a sculpture. The word combine really refers to those things that somehow exceed the traditional or the former definition of a painting. So I think he would identify himself here primarily through the tradition of painting, but subverting what painting is or adding to it. Okay, we're going to use uh, our primary reading, assigned reading for today, as uh, the text by which we'll try to make sense of what Rauschenberg is doing. Um, and this is a critic named Leo Steinberg. This is a very influential, famous essay, which most of the essays, the readings that I've given to this class are that, the kind of canon, art theory canon that we'll familiarize ourselves with, as we familiarize ourselves with the art uh, And Steinberg, um, wrote this essay uh, a, a bit after uh, Rauschenberg was really on the scene, but he's, he's addressing it specifically to understanding Rauschenberg's work. And as we have with the other uh, essays we've read, I'm, I'm, I want to begin with the title because it's a pretty telling, fascinating title. What's the title? The Flatbed Picture Plane. Now, what does that immediately make you think of? It's almost a title that perhaps Greenberg would have given to one of his essays, right? The Flat Picture Plane. <laughs> the Flat Picture Plane is what he is fairly obsessed with and what everything we've been talking about up to this point in this class is fairly uh, uh, obsessed with. Uh, Steinberg, however, doesn't title it The Flat Picture Plane, but riffs on it a little bit, titling it The Flat Bed. What do you think of with the word flatbed? A truck, yeah, a truck that you put stuff on to haul things, junk, perhaps. <laughs> what else might you think of? Well, what he uh, specifically I identifies at the, in the beginning of the essay is this. I borrowed the term from the flatbed printing press. Either way, either of those associations flatbed truck or the flatbed printing press, we have the flat picture plane suddenly turned into a flat thing that is used to carry objects or carry text, carry information, right? Either the printing press or the truck, either of them is pretty radically un-Greenbergian. It's a, it's a smart title, isn't it? It's pretty smart. The flatbed picture plane. And he goes on, I borrowed the term from the flatbed printing press, which already brings up information, distribution of information, mass communication. And I propose to use the word to describe the characteristic picture plane of the 1960s. Characteristic, I don't know, because he's, after all, Frank Stella and the minimalists are working in the 60s, but this alternative um, train of thought that we're now going to pick up and uh, carry through the 60s is certainly what he's referring to. A pictorial surface whose angulation with respect to the human posture is the precondition of its exchange con or changed content. In other words, primarily what this essay is going to be, the main image that uh, runs throughout this essay is the shift from the picture plane that Greenberg is talking about which is a vertical thing, to a flat picture plane. A horizontal picture plane, not flat. Horizontal picture plane. Um, and he's going to use that as a metaphor for describing two different ways of thinking about art making in general. The difference between the vertical picture plane and the horizontal picture plane. And that angulation with respect to the human posture is his central metaphor. Okay, so I, I want to sort out what's, um, what is the difference between a vertical um, painting and a horizontal painting. Uh, keep in mind that he is 
using this metaphor. So I just want to read some of his essay, and we'll see if we can get a sense of what he is uh, talking about, how he's using it. So on the second paragraph, if you have the reading in front of you, you can follow along. It was suggested earlier that the old masters, this is earlier in the essay, I won't give you part of it. It was suggested earlier that the old masters had three ways of conceiving the picture plan. But one axiom was shared by all three interpretations, and it remained operative in the succeeding centuries, even through cubism and abstract expressionism. In other words, through modernism, through modern painting. And what is this common um, axiom? It's the conception of the picture as representing a world, some sort of world space, which reads on the picture plane in correspondence with the erect human posture. The top of the picture corresponds to where we hold our heads aloft, while its lower edge gravitates to where we place our feet. Even in Picasso's Cubist collages, where the Renaissance world space concept almost breaks down, there is still a harking back to implied acts of vision, to something that was once actually seen, a figure, a whole fruit, and so on. A picture that harks back to the natural world evokes sense data which are experienced in the normal, erect human posture. Therefore, the Renaissance picture plane affirms verticality as its essential condition. And the concept of the picture plane as an upright surface survives the most drastic changes of style. Pictures by Rothko, Still, Newman, de Kooning, Klein, all the abstract expressionists are still addressed to us head to foot, as are those of Matisse and Miro. They are revelations to which we relate visually as from the top of a columnar body, and this applies no less to Pollock's drip paintings and poured veils and unfurls of Morris Lewis. Pollock indeed poured and dripped his pigment on ca upon canvases laid on the ground, but this was expedient, merely expedient. After the first color schemes had gone down, he would tack the canvas to the wall to get acquainted with it, um, as he used to say, uh, to see where he wanted it to go. He lived with the painting in its uprighted state as, a, as with a world confronting his human posture. Do you follow what, what uh, Steinberg is setting up? The vertical picture plane doesn't have to do with necessarily representation or abstraction has to do with how we regard the artwork. And it's this vertical posture that comes from the um, old masters, as he said, that continues through modernist painting that we stand from afar and we look into or at uh, um, an artwork uh, from a removed upright posture. Does that make, make sense? There's a sort of distance, if you will. You look into it. So, if that's what verticality is, then what's horizontality? If not even Pollock's paintings count as horizontality, what is horizontality? What is the horizontal flatbed picture plane that Steinberg had in mind? It's a little confusing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, let's see if we can sort it out. He says this. A, a little further down. Um, it's not the actual physical placement of the image that counts. There is no law against hanging a rug on a wall, something associated with the floor or horizontal on a wall, or producing a narrative picture as a mosaic floor. He would say a rug uh, serves as a horizontal until you hang it on the wall, um, and it becomes the sort of aesthetic object that he contemplates. And, uh, when you take a narrative and you put it on the floor, even though it's on the floor, you're still supposed to read it as though it's a, a, a kind of vertical, a vertical image, right? Um, so he says, he says this, something happened in painting, to explain the, the horizontal picture, something happened in painting around 1950, most conspicuously, at least within my experience, in the work of Robert Rauschenberg and Dubuffet. We're not gonna talk about Dubuffet. We can still hang their pictures, 
just as we tack up maps and architectural plans or nail a horseshoe to the wall for good luck. Yet these pictures no longer simulate vertical fields, but opaque flatbed horizontals. They no more depend on a head-to-toe correspondence with human posture than a newspaper does. The flatbed picture plane makes its symbolic allusion to hard surfaces such as tabletops, studio floors, charts, bulletin boards, any receptor surface on which objects are scattered, on which data is entered, on which information may be received, printed, impressed, whether coherently or in confusion. The pictures of the last 15 to 20 years insist on a radically new orientation in which the painted surface is no longer the analog of a visual experience of nature, but of operational processes. That was a there was a lot in there. But what is he saying? What is the horizontal picture plane? He's not talking about whether it's on the wall or it's on the floor. That's too literal. He's using a metaphor. The vertical picture is, is the window that you look through or the thing that you look at from a removed distance and you regard it as a world that you look at. Does that make sense? That's the vertical picture plane, the world that you look at. The horizontal picture plane is the world that you're already enmeshed in. You're in it. You can't get outside of it. You can't step away from it. It's the way of organizing that is organized like the, the top of my desk, where things are organized by, by some sort of priority, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of chance. Um, but they're organized by my movements in life, my practicing of life. A vertical image is one that's organized to kind of to picture something or to neatly tell a story or something like that. Are you getting the difference? The vertical picture plane is something you look at from a distance. The horizontal picture plane has to do with what you're already meshed in. Um, and those are two different organizational processes. Pointing out. So, a, a few examples. Friedrich, who we had talked about before with, with uh, respect to Rothko, is clearly a vertical, has a vertical picture plane. We look into it, we gaze through the picture plane at a world or at the world. And it's organized to be a view of this stuff that we look into. Whereas what Steinberg wants to say is that Rauschenberg's picture plane has more to, uh, has less to do with opening up a world that we look into than it does operating as a flat surface of which, on which things get accumulated. And what gets accumulated there is the stuff of life, the, the everyday remnants, debris of life. But as he uh, will say, Rothko is also vertical, even though it's abstract. It's constructed in such a way to be looked at, to be peered into. It's a kind of world that's opened up um, for us. So Rothko, he would include Pollock in this uh, as a vertical painter. Whereas what he's interested in in Rauschenberg is the way that the work, the, the stuff that goes on the surface accumulates, sticks to the surface. And even though this is hung on the wall and that's hung on the wall, he wants to call this a verticality, a, a vertical image, and he wants to call this a horizontal surface. Yeah? Did he, what did he say Pollock was? Did he say it was vertical or horizontal? Vertical is what he argues. And, and he's saying that maybe with some, uh, maybe we should hold that in some suspicion. Because <laughs> I, think, I think Pollock is someone who sort of straddles the, the two. But his argument, Steinberg's argument, is that Pollock is making the work on the floor, but to evaluate it and where it's supposed to, where the only place it belongs is on the wall, to be gazed into or to be looked, um, to be looked at from a distance, if you will. Not a physical distance, but a, a cool intellectual distance. You're not involved in that. Those are the expressions of the artist that are to be looked at, whereas Rauschenberg, uh, what he wants to say about Rauschenberg 
is this is the accumulation of the stuff of your life and your life and your life. This is the stuff that you're enmeshed in. And you're really in. You can't get out of it. You can't get away from it. You're walking on it already, so to speak. Is that, that's his argument anyway. Does that make sense, or are you suspicious of it? Yeah, I, I'm definitely suspicious of it because I can't, I mean, I, I feel like it's such a fine line I agree with you uh, that I think he's a, he's a, I, I see his point. Um, he's not, he's, he hasn't gone as far as Rauschenberg. Or we might say Rauschenberg goes, goes further in that than Pollock does, so that Pollock is leaving the traces of himself in that horizontal field, whereas Rauschenberg wants to say, I don't care about you. <laughs> and I don't care about me, he'll say, here's it. I care about the systems that are organizing my life. That's the bigger horizontal field that work can be about, and that's this stuff. And, and Pollock is, doesn't go as far. So I understand that point, but I think it's Pollock that Rauschenberg goes through, if you will. Yeah. I mean, because Pollock is horizontal. That's the horizontal picture point we've ever had one. Um, OK, good. And here's the punchline of Steinberg's essay, I think, in a, in a nutshell. What is the significant difference? Why does he care about the difference between vertical and horizontal? What's the punchline? And it is this. Um, and he says this right <coughs> after he gives that line about, you know, it's not the actual physical placement of the image that counts. You can hang a rug on a wall. You can put a narrative mosaic on the floor. So, so what does count? What I have in mind is the psychic address of the image. The psychic address. What it addresses, how it addresses us. What part of us it addresses. Its special mode of imaginative confrontation. Not imaginative in terms of unicorns and non-real but imaginative in terms of how it shapes our imagination, our thoughts, its special mode of thinking. And I tend to regard the tilt of the picture plane from vertical to horizontal as expressive of the most radical shift in the subject matter of art. It's the shift from nature to culture. It's the shift from the nature of things, not only nature of the landscape, nature of humans, nature of um, uh, fruit on a, in, in a bowl, and not also not the, the or also the nature of vision, the nature of art, the nature of form, those sort of things we've been talking about. It's a shift from all of that nature talk to culture talk. It's the shift, uh, it's the backing up and saying, Anytime you're talking about the nature of anything, including the nature of painting, what you're really talking about is the culture of painting, the culture of forms, the culture of the culture of art. It's culture that shapes uh, what we uh, perceive in nature or as the nature of anything. Does that make sense? That's his punchline, and in a nutshell, we'll unpack this more in the coming weeks, but in a nutshell, this is the postmodern term. If you want a really, really quick definition of what postmodernism is, it is the shift from nature to culture <laughs> as the, the primary determining um, subject of the conversation of any discipline. Um, it's, it's, it's a strategy of backing up and seeing Wait, how, what is shaping the intelligibility of the world around me? And it is culture that is doing it, not just the nature of things. We can't get to the nature of things without discourse and conversation and cultural structures to help us make sense of the nature of things. Did you want to? Yeah, okay, good. And we'll unpack that. That's a 
really, really brief. There's a lot more to it. Steinberg, later in this essay, the part that I didn't give to you, calls it post, this is postmodern art. Because it's certainly not modern art. We've been looking at modern art. This, uh, uh, Rauschenberg's work, is not modern. <laughs> it's not modernist. It's doing something else. Um, and we've kind of been dancing around Pollock, and I think, I think Pollock does serve as a sort of um, hub that a lot of post-war art comes out of or has to go through. It traces those train of thought, trains of thought through Pollock. We saw Greenberg wanting to interpret Pollock in formalist terms, pointing us off towards minimalism. What we're going to get now for most of the rest of the semester is other uh, artists and critics making sense of Pollock as acting in the world and making art that's, a, that's light, that is uh, about human life, not about formalism. It's about action. And, and it's that alternative um, train of thought that we'll continue to uh, consider. And specifically with Rauschenberg and this postmodern turn, the significant difference, or the way they're going to read Pollock, is basically saying it's the artist action that are the centerpiece of Pollock's work. But the thing is, is that all of our actions are part of a broader cultural landscape. I act on the canvas as a, as a citizen of this society and as someone who is in regular interaction with other people. To act on the canvas is to be a cultural piece, not like, just nature itself, as Paul said. I am nature. <laughs> the the postmodernists would say, you're not nature, you're culture. And your actions make sense to This is some review. Rosenberg sets the course for thinking about this in saying the new painting has broken down every distinction between art and life. The artist is living on canvas. Rauschenberg wants to take that and take it further, really sort that out and take it to its logical end. So how does he do this? Well, oddly enough, he starts with what we would otherwise refer to as minimalism. This is Rauschenberg's early work, and it's pure white canvas. I mean, canvas painted white uh, in three panels. He did one in seven panels, uh, and he did one in four panels. And what initially appears to be total minimalism uh, ends up having a very different effect on him and the artists that he was close to. So rather than reading this as pure form or a pure kind of minimal uh, project, they instead read them as hypersensitive screens. What, he's, what he uh, says, and the people that were around him, what they said was, once you empty out the canvas to this sort of pure white scape, what shows up there? All of the life that's going on in the room. The play of shadows, the play of lights, the bugs, <laughs> dust. You start, uh, once, you, it, once you put it, you get push painting to this point, then what shows up is the life that's going on in front of it and being lived in front of it. So they started referring to these as hypersensitive screens. Um, John Cage, have you heard of John Cage? We'll talk about John Cage in a minute. Um, John Cage is a friend of Rauschenberg, and he uh, refers to these in this way. He calls them uh, airports, <laughs> airport runways of the lights, shadows, and particles of the room. In front of them, the smallest adjustments in light and atmosphere are registered on their surface. Uh, yeah, we had a couple questions in the back there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did he actually paint on these, or is this blank canvas? Uh, I, I believe it's painted, painted white, yeah. Yeah, was there another hand up? Okay, okay, good. Um, David Hopkins, another uh, art, historian, critic, he says this, what these paintings are, are passive receptors awaiting events rather than prescribing sensation, which is what the uh, minimalists were after. There's young Rauschenberg with his four panel white painting. 
Uh, and it, it seems that this receptor surface, this receptive surface that he uses, uh, provides the basis in a strange way for all of his future work. It sets the course. Uh, once you get painting down to its pure form, what you get is not pure painting, but it flips around and it starts pointing at all of the other things around it. Uh, and so, all of that other stuff has to come into the painting. Because that's what the, that's what the canvas says anyway. Um, uh, and ultimately it will be a challenge of Greenbergian and more generally modernist uh, ideas of self-containment. That the, his assertion here is that the painting never gets self-contained. It always operates as a, as a receptive surface, as a projection screen, that we project meaning onto and, and interpret in this manner. It never becomes self-referential or self-contained or pure. Um, so what does it become receptive of? Culture around it, life around it. Um, uh, one, one critic has said, by making nothing the subject of a painting, in Rauschenberg's case, then everything else seems to enter in. <laughs> if you make the room silence, if you don't stay with silence, you get you are, are allowed to hear all of the things that are going on um, underneath the silence that have been going on underneath the silence. John Cage says this, to, to quote him once again, having made the, can the empty canvases, and by the way, a canvas is never empty, he notes this. Rauschenberg became the giver of gifts. All right, so how does this work? He eventually moves to all black, but it's black painted on over newspaper. Uh, sheets and sheets of newspaper on canvas all painted black. So the surface is not pure canvas or pure whatever, but there's information buried in it. audacious early works is that he asked Willem Kuni, a famous abstract artist, for one of his drawings, and specifically a drawing made in oil pastel, big, kind of deep, chunky, worked drawing, and asked him if he could take it and alter it. So Kuni gave it to him, uh, and he spent a month and about 40 erasers erasing it. <laughs> uh, Erasing de Kooning's drawing as much as he could get it erased, and then exhibited it as his work titled Erased de Kooning. <laughs> so what we get is the absence of an image or the erasure of an image, right? Uh, if de Kooning and abstract expressionism is so much about expression, I guess this work by Rauschenberg would be an erasure expression. So how do you read this? How do you make sense of it? It's no longer the image that you can read. There's, no, there's not much of an image left to read. Um, but you can't read it as in pure formal terms either, right? Like the, the white canvas. I mean, it's, it was something. An action has been done to it. You can't, like, formalism seems to miss, miss the point. A formalist reads to let this just have an optical effect on you. And an expressionist read doesn't seem to make any sense. So what is it? What do you read? You have to read into the action of erasing. So <coughs> what you find yourself interpreting here is what it means, the question you're asking, is what does it mean to do this thing? What does it mean to do this? And that pulls the artwork away, the interpretation away from um, reading narratives, reading images reading illusion on the one hand, so it's not that, but it also pulls it away from modernist questions of what, what, how does this strike me, what is the form, the response of the form, and instead has you reading into what it means to do this thing. And the artwork is an artifact of an action. Does that make sense? Uh, Pollock's paintings were artifacts of an action but they were still to be taken in aesthetically. What you get with Rauschenberg is you're supposed to step back and think about um, uh, 
Well, you're supposed to ask questions like, what is an artwork? Is this an artwork? <laughs> Either way, he's got you asking the questions he wants you to be asking. And the way you, you read it is you become, well, maybe we can say it this way. Once you do this, you become aware of the whole project of making a drawing and exhibiting a drawing and dis displaying a drawing. You become aware of the paper. You, you maybe become aware of the fact that this thing is framed. Is this artwork that has a frame? And then it's in, a, it's in a gallery. Does that make it artwork? Is this artwork? What you, uh, by Rauschenberg doing this, what he has you concentrating on is the cultural structure that is holding this thing and making this thing possible. Does that, does that get more grip with you? <laughs> it pushes you off to the cultural form. He interrupts the artwork. Maybe that's the way of talking about it. He interrupts the artwork so that you start to pay attention to the whole project of making. And of course, that is Duchamp. If you've taken modernity, um, you know that that whole train of thought, that whole um, set of questions is thoroughly Duchamp. So we have to go back further than Pollock to understand Rauschenberg. We have to go back to Duchamp. And what is Duchamp doing? He presents things like what we just saw and this, which is a year and that he signs and exhibits in an artwork, submits to, or uh, exhibits in a gallery. He submits to an open call in which they say they'll take any artwork because they're so avant-garde. And so he submits this and they reject it and he says, <coughs> on what basis? Um, all with the intention of asking the question, what is art? Uh, what counts as art? And ultimately the question is, to make it brief, is Duchamp's suggestion is that what makes it art is when it arts. That whole idea of the action of arting is Duchamp. What is art? Art is whatever I set up in such a way that you start asking questions, is this art? If I've got you asking questions of is this art, I've already got you uh, thinking about an object in a way that is reflective and that is um, conceptual and that is sorting out the meaningfulness of a thing beyond its use value, right? If you don't key in this thing and instead if you ask yourself, is this art? Then it's art is, is his answer. Uh, I mean, he put the urinal up there to be intentionally, to push it as far as possible. What's the most objectionable? that still has some kind of aesthetic value that would kind of raise hackles? How do I push this question far enough that it really gets traction? A, a urine. <laughs> uh, that is signed, it's art. And so it draws your attention by putting a urine off there. It draws your attention to the whole supporting structure. It's presented, it's in a gallery, it's lit, it's signed. It has been made, not by the artist, but by someone. It has this beautiful form to it. Uh, it's got all of these things. Is that what makes it art? The institutions that support it and make sense of it. Okay, so the cultural structure that Duchamp points us toward. And that cultural structure includes the audience. That how do you know if it's art? When it's arting, and when does something art? Not because of what the artist does, but because of what the audience does. If the audience is having a meaningful encounter with it, that's what makes it art. So audiences make art, art. not artists. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. Yeah. The, art, the artist is part of the audience. The artist initiates the, the interaction. So he says this, all in all, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his contribution to the creative act. It is the audience that interprets and interpretation is where art is, not in the expression. This quote, I don't know off the top of my head, I didn't write it down. Um, We'll get back to Rauschenberg because we 
haven't really talked about him <laughs> much today, which is the point. Uh, I want to introduce to uh, Cage real quickly, and then we'll break, um, and we'll get back to Rauschenberg. Uh, following further behind, oh, that's okay. John Cage. Some of you are familiar with John Cage, uh, and we got to bring him into this orbit. Duchamp, Rauschenberg, Cage. We could bring a few others in, but once we get Cage, we'll, we'll be ready to get back to Rauschenberg. It makes sense. Cage, you can also identify uh, with 1955. He is a friend of Rauschenberg's early on, and they are really influence, uh, influential to each other. Rauschenberg is a painter. Cage is a musician and an experimental musician. Uh, and the gist of Cage's work, and what he's going to argue is the gist of Rauschenberg's work and, and um, much of this alternative trans thought we're going to be talking about, is this. What is art? If art is arty, if it's, uh, if it's achieving the act of um, meaningful engagement on the part of the audience, what is it doing? How do we know if it's, if it's art? The task of art is waking us up to the very life we're living. And that's pretty radically counter minimalism. Minimalism isn't supposed to, well, you could argue, the whole form of well, we won't go into that. Uh, the task of minimalism is more separation, impurity, aesthetic disinterestedness, and so on. Uh, this is going to be radically minimalist. It's about life and the life you're living. If art turns you back to having more meaningful relationships in your life with what's actually around you, a deeper thoughtfulness about the world around you, then it, it is, that is the best kind of art. As far as Cage is concerned and Rauschenberg. They don't care if you regard it as uh, deserving of, of, of being beautifully crafted or finely crafted, or any of those <coughs> skills. They don't care about those things, because some of the times those things pull you away from life. They get stuck in museums, and so on. They're, they're too aesthetic and disinterested. The art that works best points you to the life you're living. So how does the cage do this? By strategically interrupting the operation of everyday life. And specifically, interrupting the conventions of art making. So he would do, <laughs> he would do uh, concerts on pianos that were too small. Why? Because it, it interrupts your expectation. What is he doing? Why is he doing it? Oh, well, I guess I never really paid that much attention to the size of the piano before. What is this format that we've gone on before? That's just how you're do it. And by far his most significant interruption, most famous or infamous interruption, is the one called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. And it is a four minute and 33 second performance of rest. Uh, it's a composition um, that is just rest uh, for four and a half minutes, which is the average length of a pop song. Um, uh, rest. So the, the pianist uh, comes up to the piano uh, and, and everyone claps and, and he sits down and he's, uh, he, has, he opens the piano and then he rests. <laughs> and if you could be there, you would imagine the experience. Your eyes would not keep fixed on the pianist for very long, but instead would sort of wander to your neighbors, to whoever you came with, to the, perhaps the whole thing. Uh, you would start looking everywhere and becoming attentive to everything except uh, the person on stage 
doing this performance. And in Cage's train of thought, that is priceless. If he gets you paying attention to the whole structure that is normally invisible during a performance, a musical performance, if he gets you paying attention to all of that, in other words, paying attention to what you expect to happen, uh, and you pay attention to that because he disrupts your expectations, then he has uh, pulled off the most profound art possible in his terms, right? He's pointed you back to the life you're living and to all of those things that are normally uh, invisible. He says this, John Cage, the sound experience with I pref which I prefer to all others is the experience of silence. And the silence, almost everywhere in the world now, is traffic. Uh, and you see what he's doing there. He's doing the same thing that Rauschenberg's early white paintings did. Empty things out to silence, and then you become aware of the din, the cultural hustle and bustle that has been going on all the time, but that but gets covered up by my talking. The earphones in my ears, and so on and so forth. It's that turn towards the, the cultural din the traffic, if you will, that is at the center of Rauschenberg's cross, uh, uh, work and the center of postmodern art in general. That strategy of interrupting processes so that we start paying attention to the cultural structures that are normally invisible is postmodernism. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.